Okay, welcome to part four of Where Did the Book of Mormon Come From? Remember we were talking about Solomon Spalding, right? And we talked about how he had written a second manuscript called Manuscript Found. And we believe that somebody copied it and or stole it or both. And so in order to keep going, we just got to keep on connecting these dots is what we're going to do. So interesting enough, you know, uh, 1816, Spalding dies. Um, then a 14-year gap, Book of Mormon is published in 1830. And then there's missionary activity taking place uh, throughout the region. And people are being converted. And one of the people that was converted was a man called D.P. Hobart. I know, that's a strange name, right? Uh, he became converted in 1833. So let me tell you a little bit about his biography. He was born February 3rd, 1809 in Vermont. He moved several places westward from 1809 to 1833. And in February 1833, we think that's when he was converted to the LDS faith. We know that March 18, 1833, he was made an elder or missionary at Kirtland, Ohio. Uh, then in mid-March, he goes on his mission eastward. And in mid-April, he preached near Jacksonville or what's called Albion, Pennsylvania. And that's a very strong possibility where he may have been hearing these rumors or hearing were, uh, you know, hearing about that Spalding's writings. But that, that's based on speculation, okay? Now, while on this mission, it's a strong probability that he probably did have unlawful relationships, relations with a female. Um, he returned to Kirtland, Ohio, June 3rd. Orson Hyde, his mission partner, made charges against him about his unlawful conduct. And then in mid-June, mid Hobart petitioned for a retrial. And then June 22nd was charged again with unlawful conduct. And then June 23rd, after the hearing, he was cut off from the church again. And in July, he actually started holding public lectures, lecturing against the LDS faith. So... Around June 24th, um, he returned to Springfield, Pennsylvania, as you can see there uh, from where Kirtland, Ohio is, and he began holding lectures against the LDS faith around that area. Um, now, you can kind of see where West Springfield is, where that area is at, and then go a little bit eastward here. So this is Albion, Pennsylvania, where the Jackson settlement was. So after that area, he went to Albion where it's highly probable he met a Mr. Jackson. Now, maybe it is at this time that he started hearing things about Spalding. And it may have been Lyman Jackson around July 1833. It's really, this is really hard to know when and exactly it was. Now, Benjamin Winchester, he writes about um, the um, Hulbert, and he says this during the six or eight months, but actually, if we were to be precise, it's four to six months, that Mr. Hulbert was preaching in the state of Pennsylvania. Part of the time he belonged to the church, part of it he was lecturing against it. He formed a large circle of acquaintance and mingled with all sorts of classes of people. While in a small village called the Jackson Settlement, a place that's famous for its infidels, he became familiar with a family of the name of Jackson and others who were personally acquainted with the now celebrated Solomon Spalding who is reputed to be the legitimate author of the Book of Mormon. Here, while in conversation with them, Mr. Halbert learned that Mr. Spalding, while alive, wrote a work called The Manuscript Found. Now, any of these persons had the most distant idea that this novel had ever been converted into the Book of, Mo into the Book of Mormon, or that there was any connection between them. Indeed, Mr. Jackson, who had read both the Book of Mormon and Spalding's manuscript, told Mr. Hulbert when he came to get a signature to the writing testifying to the probability that Mr. Spalding's manuscript had been converted into the Book of Mormon, that there was no agreement between them. For, said he, Mr. Sp uh, Spalding's manuscript was a very small work in the form of a novel, saying not one word about the children of Israel, but professed to give an account of a race of people who originated from the Romans, which is referring to that first manuscript, which Mr. Spalding said he had translated from a Latin parchment that he had found, and that's true, too, about the first manuscript. The Book of Mormon, he added, purports to be written by a branch of the House of Israel. It's written in a different style and altogether different. For this reason, Mr. Jackson refused to lend his name to the lie um, and expressed his indignation and contempt at the base and wicked project used to deceive the public. Mr. Jackson was a good man and a good citizen, and after hearing that such a novel had been written, 
Mr. Hulbert, in order to carry out his designs, resolved to make this fact the foundation of a notorious fabrication, and at the same time make it appear as plausible as possible to deceive the world and induce them to account for the origin of the Book of Mormon in some other way than the truth. So what uh, what we see Benjamin Winchester trying to do is he's trying to say that Hulbert is the originator of the Spalding theory. But what we're going to see is that that's just not the case. So let's talk about some pointers from Winchester. Number one, Winchester is writing from the perspective that Hulbert was the originator, like we just said. But I think we can prove that that's not true, as we'll see later on. Number two, Jackson was able to remember the first manuscript. So it's something that Solomon Spalding had showed him previously before the spring of 1812. And we'll show evidence, I think, that there are two or more manuscripts. But the main point to understand is that Hulbert heard a connection about Spalding's writings. And Hulbert may have learned to see the Spalding, see the Spaldings in Conuitville from Jackson, which I'm talking about John Spalding, his bro older brother, uh, sorry, his brother, and Martha, his wife. Or Hulbert may have also heard about those who lived in Conuit from Jackson. So, um, most likely, he actually learned it from, uh, he went to John and Martha Spalding. So after Albion, Pennsylvania, he traveled to Conuitville, and he met the Spaldings, and the first two witnesses is John and Martha Spalding. All right, so before we look at the witness statements, so you have to give four tests um, to show if a witness is reliable or not. And what's what's really interesting is you can do this with the gospel writers, and it's interesting how they pass the four tests with flying colors. So number one, were they present? Were they at the right time and place to have heard or read Spalding's manuscript? Two, were they corroborated? Meaning, is there some support of their statements that can be given as evidence? Number three, were they accurate? What did they say? How well were their words preserved? What about their details they give? Were they correct in their details? Were they consistent with one another? And then number four, were they biased? What would be their arterial motive for lying? What was there, was there overwhelming prejudice? And we're going to use this color, color system. We're going to use red with present to purple with corroborated, blue with accurate, and green with uh, nerf with bias bias. So I think you'll see that it's really interesting uh, what we're going to find out. And I got this from Code Case Christianity written by J. Warren Wallace, just to let y'all know where the material comes from. Okay. Now we're going to be doing a lot of reading because really a lot of this, my friends, has to do with reading the original sources. <clears throat> so John Spalding, uh, Hulbert took down his statement. Solomon Spalding was born in Ashford, Connecticut in 1761 and early life contracted a taste for literary pursuits. After he left school, he entered Plainfield Academy where he made great proficiency in study and excelled most of his classmates. He next commenced the study of law in Winham County which he made little progress, having in the meantime turned his attention to religious subjects. He soon after entered Dartmouth College with the intention of qualifying himself for the ministry, where he obtained a degree of A.M. and was afterwards regularly ordained. After preaching three or four years, he gave it up, removed to Cherry Valley, New York, and commenced the mercantile business in company with his brother, Josiah. In a few years, he fell in business, and in the year 1809, removed to Conuit in Ohio. The year following, I removed to Ohio and found him engaged in building a forge. I made him a visit in about three years after and found that he had failed and considerably involved in debt. Now notice these statements, color-coded. He then told me he had been writing a book. Now, now I want you to notice this. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and point this out. So in 1809, right? And then three years after, 1812. Spring of 1812, I think he was starting to write about manuscript found. He then told me he had been writing a book, which he intended to have printed, the avails of which he thought would enable him to pay all debts, all his debts. The book was entitled The Manuscript Found, of which he read to be many passages. It was a historical romance of the first settlers of America, endeavoring to show that the American Indians are the descendants of the Jews or the lost tribes. 
It gave a, de a detailed account of their journey from Jerusalem by land and sea till they arrived in America, under the command of Nephi and Lehi. They afterwards had quarrels and contentions and separated into two distinct nations, one of which he denominated Nephites and the other Lamanites. Cruel and bloody wars ensued, which, in which great multitudes were slain. They buried their dead in large heaps, which caused the mounds so common in this country. Their arts, sciences, and civilization were brought into view in order to account for all the curious antiquities found in various parts of North and South America. I have recently read the Book of Mormon, and to my great surprise, I find nearly the same historical matter names as they were in my brother's writings. I well remember um, that he wrote in the old style, and he commenced about every sentence with, and it came to pass, or now it came to pass, the same as in the Book of Mormon. And according to the best of my recollection and belief, it is the same as my brother Solomon wrote, with the exception of the religious material matter. By what means it has fallen into the hands of Joseph Smith, Jr., I am unable to determine. John Spaulding. Then Martha Spaulding wrote, uh, her statement was taken. I was personally acquainted with Solomon Spaulding about 20 years ago. I was at his house a short time before he left Conuit. He was then writing a historical novel founded upon the first settlers of America. He represented them as an enlightened and warlike people. He had for many years contended that the aborigines of America were the descendants of some of the lost tribes of Israel. And this idea he carried out in the book in question. The lapse of time which has intervened prevents my rec recollecting but few of the leading incidents of his writings. But the names of Nephi and Lehi are yet fresh in my memory as being the principal heroes of his tale. They were officers of the company which first came off from Jerusalem. He gave a particular account of their journey from land and sea till they arrived in America after which disputes arose between the chiefs, which caused them to separate into different lands, one of which was called Lamanites and the other Nephites. Between these were recounted tremendous battles, which frequently covered the grounds of the slain, and there being buried in large heaps was a lot cause of the numerous mounds in the country. Some of these people were he represented as being very large. I have read the Book of Mormon, which has brought fresh to my recollection the writings of Solomon Spalling, and I have no manner of doubt that the historical part of it is the same that I read and heard read more than 20 years ago. The old obsolete style and the phrase of and it came to pass are the same. Martha Spalding. So you can see there that they, they got their statements taken and then they probably told Holbert to journey to Conuet for similar testimony since that's where um, he where Solomon Spalding once lived. And so Solomon Spalding journeyed there. And remember that he had stayed with this man for several months. He boarded with him. Um, of course, that was in 1809. Um, but it's it's really possible that even in 1812, um, it's possible that he had read read a book. Now listen to what he says. When Solomon Spalding first came to his, this place, he purchased a tract of land, surveyed it out, and commenced selling it. While engaged in this business, he boarded at my, at my house in all nearly six months. All his leisure hours were occupied in writing a historical novel founded upon the first settlers of this country. He said he intended to trace their journey from Jerusalem by land and sea to their arrival in America, giving account of their arts, sciences, civilization, wars, and contentions. In this, way, in this way, he would give a satisfactory account of all the old mounds so common to this country. During the time he was at my house, I read and heard... 100 pages or more. Now, it's it might be possible that... Uh, and I'm trying to... I should go back up to see... Because that might be important for us to do if you want to. If we want to. Um, let's look here for a moment. Where would that be, though? Let's look back for a moment here. Yeah. Yeah. So you see, move back to Conuit, short stay several months in 1809 with Oliver Smith. So it is possible that Oliver Smith might be mixing up. But, and, and, and I, and I want to admit things whenever they come up here. Um, but it's also possible. Um, but then, I heard red. Oh, sorry, never mind. All right, so he says, but it's, it's it's interesting because there is no characters in manuscript story by the name of Nephi and Lehi. So he's not correct in all of his details, but 
look at what I mean. Look at all what he says. And he finally, however, by him represented as leading characters when my when they first started for America. Their main object was to escape the judgments. And this is this is very special because he's the this is the one detail that he points out that I don't think any others point out if I remember correctly. We say suppose we're coming upon the old world, but no religious matter was introduced, as I now re recollect. And what he's talking about there is all these New Testament scriptures, as we will point out. Just before he left this place, Spalding sent for me to call on him, which I did. He then said that although he was in my debt, he intended to leave the country and I and hoped I would not prevent him. For he says, he, you know, I have been writing the history of the first settlers, settle, settlement of America. And I intend to go to Pittsburgh and there live in a re retired life till I completed the work when it is printed. It will bring me a fine sum of money. See, he's going to Pittsburgh, and in the spring of eight, you know, that's in the spring of eighteen, uh, autumn of eighteen twelve, that he he goes to Pittsburgh. So, it's you know possible they even showed an, another manuscript to him, and Oliver Smith didn't know the difference between the two. You know, it's possible. Um. It will bring me a fine sum of money, which will enable me to return and pay off all my debts. The book you know will sell, as everyone is anxious to learn something upon that subject. This was the last I heard of Spalling or his book, until the Book of Mormon came into the neighborhood. When I heard the historical part of it related, I once said it was the writings of old Solomon Spalling. And that's interesting, because when you do read manuscript story, um, there, it's... It would be hard to justify that... Now, there's... We're going to talk about how there's similar themes and stuff like that. But if you were to hear some manuscript story being read, I don't think, you know, nobody would come to their mind that they're thinking of the Book of Mormon, as we'll, as we'll talk about in later videos. I had once said it was the writings of Old Solomon Spalling. Soon after I obtained the book, and on reading it, found much of it the same as Spalling had written more than 20 years before. All right. <clears throat> All right, let's look at Nahum Howard. He's a doctor, and he says, I first became acquainted with Solomon Spalling in December 1810. After that time, I frequently saw him at his house and also at my house. I, once in conversation with him, expressed a surprise at not having any account of the inhabitants once in this country. He erected the old forts, mounds, etc. He then told me that he was writing a history of that race of people and afterwards frequently showed me his writings, which I read. I have lately read the Book of Mormon and believed it to be the same as Spalding wrote, except the religious part. He told me he intended to get his writings published in Pittsburgh and thought that in one century from that time, it would be believed as much as any other history. And I found that kind of, I mean, I, I find that ironically sad because it's sad to me that this book of fiction has been taught as if, as if it was in true reality, when in fact it's not. And then Aaron Wright says, I first became acquainted with Solomon Spalding in 1808 or 1809. When he commits building a forge on Conuit Creek, when at his house one day he showed and read to me a history he was writing of the lost tribes of Israel, purporting that they were the first settlers of America, and that the Indians were their descendants. Upon the subject, we had frequent conversations. He traced their journey from Jerusalem to America, and as is given in the Book of Mormon, accepting the religious matter. The historical part of the Book of Mormon I know to be the same as I read and heard read from the writings of Spalding more than 20 years ago. The names more especially are the same without any alteration, and in which... You know, interesting enough, when he talks about names there, we're, we're going to see later on. The names are totally different from those in the Book of Mormon. I'm talking about between, um, sorry, manuscript story characters, uh, the first manuscript, and the second, what I purport to be the second manuscript, manuscript found. He told me his object was to account for all the fortifications, etc., to be found in this country, and that in time it would be fully believed by all, except learned men and historians. I once anticipated reading his writings in print, but little expected to see them in a new Bible. Spalding had many other manuscripts, and this is interesting uh, that he says that because this is in August 1833, and we're going to see later on that Holbert gets another statement from him, and he's going to say, uh, the manuscript you found, Holbert, that's not identical to the manuscript found. And so he's already saying that Spalding wrote several manuscripts, which I expect to see when Smith translates his other plate. In conclusion, I will observe that the names of and most of the historical part of the Book of Mormon was as, were as familiar to me before I read it as most modern history. If it is not Spalding's writing, it is the same as he wrote. And as Smith was inspired, I think it was by the same spirit that Spalding was. 
which he confessed to be the love of money. So you can see that several of those people were taking their, uh, Holbert wrote down their statements. And we see that he journeys from Conuit and he goes down to Kirtland, Ohio. And he wanted to do some more public lectures against the LES church. And he thought he might gain some support. And there is a committee that starts to sponsor him. Well, what do those witnesses have to say? Um, well, he he returns to Conway, Ohio, and he's introduced some more witnesses who testified of the same facts. And he also went to some other places to obtain testimony. So... What do we see those witnesses have to say? Well, he met Henry Lake. So Henry Lake says this is in September of 1833. So remember that those other ones were in August of 1833. He says, I left the state of New York late in the year 1810 and arrived at the pl this place about the 1st of January following. Soon after my arrival, I formed a co-partnership with Solomon Spalding for the purpose of rebuilding a forge, which he had commenced a year or two before and We'll see evidence for that. He very frequently read to me from a manuscript which he was writing, which he entitled The Manuscript Found, and which he represented as being found in this town. I spent many hours in hearing him read said writings and became well acquainted with its contents. He wished me to assist him in getting his production printed, alleging that a book of that kind would meet with a rapid sale. I designed doing so, but the forge is not, was not meeting our ex anticipations. We failed in business when I declined having anything to do with the publication of the book. This book represented the American Indians as the descendants of the lost tribes, giving an account of their leaving Jerusalem, their contention of wars, which were many and great. One time, now this is interesting. This is one of the many specific details that he gives. One time when he was reading to me the tragic account of Laban, I pointed out to him what I considered an inconsistency, which he promised to correct. But by referring to the Book of Mormon, I find to my surprise that it stands there just as he read it to me then. Some months ago, I borrowed the Golden Bible, put it in my pocket, uh, put and carried it home and thought no more about it, of it. But a week after, my wife found the book in my co coat pocket as it hung up and commenced reading it aloud as I lay upon the bed. She had not read 20 minutes, so I was astonished to find the same passages in it that Spalding had read to me more than 20 years before from his manuscript found. Since I have fully more examined the said Golden Bible and have no hesitation in saying that the historical part of it is principally, if not wholly taken from manuscript, the manuscript found, I will recollect telling Mr. Spalding that the so frequent use of the words, and, there was this, and it came to pass, now it came to pass, rendered it ridiculous. And you'll see, and it's interesting, friends, in manuscript story, this phrase is not even found, but it's found all the time, almost, in the Book of Mormon in the 18, especially the 1830 edition. Spalding left here in 1812, and I furnished him the means to carry him to Pittsburgh, where he said he would get the book printed to pay, and pay me. But I never heard any more from him or his writings, so I saw them in the Book of Mormon. <clears throat> and then John Miller, he, he worked with him uh, also, in the year 1811, I was in the ploy of Henry Lake and Solomon Spalding at Conuet, engaging in rebuilding a forge. While there, I boarded and lodged in the family of said Spalding for several months. I was soon introduced to the manuscript of Spalding and perused them as often as I had leisure. He had written two or three books or pamphlets on different subjects, often, uh, but that which more particularly drew my attention was one which he called the manuscript found. From this, he would frequently read some humorous pas passages. So that's one of the specific details he gives to the company present. It purported to be the history of the first settlements of America before discovered by Columbus. He brought them off from Jerusalem under their leaders, detailing their travels by land and water, their manners, customs, laws, wars, etc. He said that he designed it as a historical novel, and then after years it would be believed by many people as much as the history of England. He soon after fell in business and told me he should retire from the den of his creditors, finish his book, have it published, which would enable him to pay his debts and support his family. He soon after removed to Pittsburgh, as I understood. I have recently examined the Book of Mormon and find it in, in the writings of Solomon Spalding from beginning to end, but mixed up with scripture and other religious matter, which I did not meet with in the manuscript found. So he gets more, he's even more specific, specific about what, what it means when there's no religious matter, and that he says mixed up with scripture. Many of the passages in the, book of, in the Mormon book are verbatim from Spalding and others in part. 
And we're going to prove, I think we can show that, especially in the, like the latter end of the book of Alma. The names of the Lephi, uh, Nephi, Lehi, Moroni, and in fact, all the principal names are brought fresh to my recollection by the Go Bible. When Spalding divests divest his history of its fabulous names by a verbal explanation, he landed his people near the Straits of Darien, another specific detail he gives, which I am very confident he called Zarahemla. They were marched about that country for a length of time, in which wars and great war blood shed ensued. He brought them across North America in a northeast direction. And then there is Artemis Cunningham, who was the cre a creditor to Spalding. All right, so it says, In the month of October of 1811, I went from the township of Madison to Conuit for the purpose of securing a debt due me from Solomon Spalding. I tarried with him nearly two days for the purpose of accomplishing my object, which I was finally unable to do. I found him destitute of the means of paying his debts. His only hope of ever paying his debts appeared to me upon the sale of a book which he had been writing. He endeavored to convince me from the nature and character of the work that it would meet with a ready sale. Before showing me his manuscripts, he went into a verbal relation of its outline, saying that it was a fabulous or romantic history of the first settlement of this country, and as, is, and as it purported to have been a record found buried in the earth or in a cave, he had adopted the ancient or scripture style of writing. He then presented his manuscripts when he sat down and spent a good share of the night in reading them and conversing upon them. I well remember the name of Nephi, which appears to be the principal hero of the story. The frequent repetition of the phrase, I, Nephi, which is found in 1 Nephi and 2 Nephi, I recollect as distinctly as though it was but yesterday. Although the general features of the story have passed from my memory through the lapse of 22 years, he attempted to account for the numerous antiquities which are found upon this, this continent and remarked that after this generation had passed away, his account of the first inhabitants of America would be considered as authentic as any other history. The Mormon Bible, I have partially examined and then fully of the opinion that Solomon Spalding had written its outlines before he left Conuit. So, I hope you can see um, quite a bit of us, quite a bit to unpack, and we're going to look, we're going to make these four tests apply and ex examine the reliability of these witnesses. So we're going to stop there. I really appreciate you being with us. Thank you so much. And I hope you'll join us next time. Thank you very much.